recording now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. My name is Melissa Mati. I'm one of the Fulton County a &R agents. Um, I've been emailing you from Eventbrite, so hopefully you have my email. If not, I will put it in the chat at the end. Um, but we've gotten a lot of requests for this topic because we've done a lot of talks on vegetable and ornamental and herb gardening. And pretty much the question that is asked every single time is, well, what do I do if I don't have sun? Um, so hopefully this will answer some of those questions and give you some creative ideas. So we're gonna hit four main bullet points today. Um, we're gonna review types of shade because the type of shade that you have in your yard can be really important to uh, determining what plants you can actually use in your space. We're gonna talk about some considerations for planting because you've gotta have the right plant in the right place and you have to condition the soil correctly, all sorts of things. Um, most of the problems that we see with plantings are from people who just didn't plan enough uh, or weren't that familiar with the space. So we'll go over some things that you need to be thinking about before you, you go wild on uh, planting your shade garden. And then we're going to get to my favorite is uh, design tips. This is where you can really express yourself in your garden and uh, add some more things to your toolbox. And then finally, we're going to uh, wrap it up with some plant recommendations. So um, the meat of this is really just teaching you the concepts. Uh, I'm going to have some very basic plant recommendations at the end um, because this is shade gardening for beginners. Uh, so if you don't see a plant on there that you really love, you're welcome to ask me about it if there's time. Uh, but don't be surprised if there's only a few plants there. So just wanted to explain that. So first and foremost, what actually makes a shade garden? And a shade garden is defined as cultivated plantings um, in an area with little to no direct sunlight. So it can have dappled sunlight, bright indirect sunlight, and it is actually cultivated. So shade gardens are typically going to mimic a forest floor. That's why we see a lot of ferns, um, hostas do really well, things that love well-drained shady soil. Although forest floors themselves are not considered shade gardens, because they're actually not manually cultivated. They're just natural happenstance. So that's what determines a shade garden. You can have a ton of different plant species or you can have only a few different plant species. There are some great shade gardens that have a lot of diversity, but there are also some gorgeous shade gardens that only have a couple of ferns and just use their space really wisely, or there are entire shade gardens made up of hostas. So depending on what motif and consistency you're looking for. You can have as diverse or uniform of a garden as you would like. A shade garden can be any size or shape. It can be an acre if it's well managed or it can be a small pot in the shade. It really doesn't matter. Um, a shade garden just has shady plants and it is responsibly managed. And then it's also important to incorporate shade tolerant and shade loving plants. Um, so that seems like a no brainer. There is a slight difference between them that we'll go over later, but of course a shade garden is primarily made up of uh, shade, shade loving plants. So let's review types of shade. This is really important to understand as you plan your garden because the type of shade and the location of shade can be very dependent on the time of year, um, the angle of the sun, of course, and um, as well as what types of trees you have. Do you have deciduous trees? Do you have evergreen trees? All sorts of different factors. So the brightest type of shade is going to be partial shade. So we see a lot of plants that love uh, part shade in Home Depot, pikes, a lot of garden centers. That's what that part shade or part sun means. Um, you get about three to six hours of direct sunlight daily. So that seems like a lot of sunlight, but it's still not enough to really grow vegetables very well. Vegetables are gonna need six to eight hours or more, and that's what we consider full sun. So the next step down is gonna be this partial shade with only three to six hours of direct sunlight. And something to consider is just as important as how much sun you have is the time of day that that sun is on your, um, on your surface. So morning sun is going to be the gentlest. So if you wanna plant a shade garden and you do have some direct sunlight, 
you do want it to be morning sun. Um, it's gonna be, like I said, more gentle. It's not during the heat of the day, so you're gonna have less burns, less stress in your plants. Um, so that's gonna be ideal for your shade garden if it is partial shade. Now, if you have light shade, uh, you're going to have three or less hours of direct sunlight, but you still have very bright indirect light. Um, so if you look here, the trees are a little bit taller. Um, you may have, you know, 15 to 20 feet tall trees with some 10 feet tall trees. You have a lot of dappled light and um, bright indirect light. As I said, you may have some solid rays of light coming through, um, but there is definitely more significant shade here. Medium shade is where we see a lot of our shade gardens. Um, it's, it's what we think of uh, when you see a park and you see those tall oak trees um, and they're very shady underneath. Um, you know, this, the deciduous trees may drop their leaves and it may get some sun over the winter. So if you plant some bulbs, um, that's a very good idea uh, because the, the sunlight will actually keep the bulbs a little bit warm over the winter. So you don't need to dig them all up. Um, and you know some dappled light but not nearly as much as light shade and part shade. Um, it's going to be noticeably cooler under these medium shade environments. And then finally we have full or dense shade. A lot of these if you've ever walked through a hemlock stand or through the woods of North Georgia or other virgin forests, this is going to be a great example of full or dense shade very mature trees, very tall, very large leaves or evergreen trees uh, with dense branches. There is little to no dappled light. You don't really see any rays of sun at all. Um, all the light that you get in there is all bright and indirect light. It's all filtered through. So those are the main types of shade. We also have one a uh, type of shade that is a little bit more unique and a lot of times it's man-made and that's called open shade. So open shade is when a surface is exposed to the sky, so there's nothing directly above it, but there's still no direct sunlight. So here you can see, um, this is actually caused by the angle of the sun. So if you look in the lawn space right there, um, that's shady, but there's no tree above it. That shade is caused by the hedge. So you're usually going to see these in constructed environments like um, hedges, buildings are a very common uh, source of open shape. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can also see it along forest edges. Um, so that's a good example there. And we'll come back to this picture because it's, it's a great example of a little shade garden. All right, so now um, considerations for planting your shade garden. Nine times out of 10, when you have a shade garden, you will also have plenty of trees. So it's really important to understand how to work with your trees and not damage them and not leave your plants out to dry competing with these trees. So the first rule we have is to never cover tree roots, specifically never cover them with soil or clay, never try to bury them. So I guess never bury your roots is a better way to put that because in some occasions, it's okay to put mulch over it. It's okay to plant ground covers that trail over the roots. Um, that's fine. That allows for a bit more airflow and drainage, but burying roots, uh, especially near the tree collar, that can be very, very damaging to the tree, even if it's a very old mature tree. You also need to be careful when digging. So a lot of people go whole hog into digging up their shade garden and forget that there are going to be roots underground as well. Um, so just be very careful. Obviously, if you nick a large root of a 50 year old oak tree, that's going to have a different impact than if you nick oh. the roots of a, um, of a, uh, what was it? Oh, Japanese maple, like a, a small Japanese maple. The smaller the tree, the more sensitive the roots are going to be. Um, so just be very careful when you're digging. Um, you can even take like a little barbecue school skewer or something that's about the, the length um, of the planting that you're doing. So say you need a 12 inch deep hole, take a 12 inch wire, maybe like some of those survey flags that they have and poke into the soil to try to find the roots and maybe flag some some of those roots of those more delicate trees so you don't um, damage them as much. 
if you have a lot of roots and you're just fighting root after root, maybe consider containers. Plant up. Um, you don't necessarily have to have your shade garden directly in the soil. Um, you can place your containers all around the tree. Again, just be careful of the roots. Don't set them on the roots. Um, don't tie the containers around branches or around the tree that can girdle branches in the trunk. That would be bad for it. But, um, you know, use different types of containers. Really make it your own space and use that as a, as a form of expression. Um, you can also consider spreading ground covers. So if you don't have a lot of spaces where you can plant something substantial, plant something that will spread and fill in. Periwinkle is a great example. Uh, the Star of Bethlehem and Crocus are also great examples that look very similar to the upper right. They fill in, they look very natural, um, but they, they just kind of propagate naturally. So you don't need to keep digging and planting. Over a couple of years, they will really fill in very easily. And then finally, know your tree. Um, just a couple of examples. Uh, the type of tree is going to influence the type of root situation that you find yourself in. So things like oaks, uh, especially when they're mature, they have very wide sp widespread roots that can be a little deeper. So odds are you're gonna find a little bit more crevices and spots to plant than something like a maple, which is going to have denser roots. So you may have to go a little further out from the trunk to actually plant successfully. And that's gonna mean that you have less canopy space to play with potentially. So that's just something to think about. Um, the type of tree is going to really affect the amount of planting space that you have underneath it, not only because of the size of its canopy, but also because of the extensive nature of their roots. Soil drainage is essential for shade gardens. And this is because you have less sun. So if you do have an irrigation leak or you have a wet spot, you're not going to have a lot of sun exposure to evaporate that water off, which means that water is going to sit there longer than it would otherwise. And a lot of shade plants, despite um, it being kind of cooler and a little bit damp in forests, don't really like wet feet because if you think about the natural biology of shady plants in nature, um, the forest floor is littered with uh, leaf debris, um, organic matter, humus, things that are very, very quick draining, very fast draining soils. So a lot of plants that like that environment are also going to like fast draining soils. So never let them sit in wet feet. That's going to end up just turning into a marsh or a swamp. And that's not really, that's a different kind of gardening talk. Um, so you can also add amendments where necessary. If you're having trouble draining because there's a lot of clay, um, or there's just a really, really soaking wet spot, you can try to add some compost um, that can really help with drainage. Um, you know, just kind of till it in and incorporate it. Of course, be very careful of the roots. And you are going to want to incorporate it in the plot beyond just the whole of the plant that you're planting. You really want to try to get that shade garden plot uniform in soil texture as much as possible. Um, because you want everybody to have the same nutrition, um, you want to have the same drainage, you don't want spots that hold water more than others. So similar, um, you have less sun, less evaporation. If you have less sun, you have less growth, so that means you don't need as much fertilizer. A lot of times if you take regular miracle grow instructions and you take the attachment that you can put on a hose and spray your shade garden with it, you will get fertilizer burns. These plants grow very slowly. They have evolved to their uh, shady situation. They don't need as much sun because they don't grow as fast. That means they don't use as much fertilizer. So just be very, very careful that I do see a lot of shade gardens that experience a lot of fertilizer burn. Most of the time you don't even really need to add fertilizer, especially if you're already amending with comp compost. These plants are very, very efficient. And I told you I'd come back to this, the shade tolerant versus shade loving. An easy way to know the difference between these two are basically what is its default? So to tolerate something, you don't really want to deal with it, but you will. So a shade tolerant plant may prefer sun, um, but still perform acceptably 
um, in the shade versus shade loving will always prefer to be in the shade. Um, but some shade loving plants may be sun tolerant. So again, read the labels on your plants very carefully. Keep the labels on your plants, especially. And then finally, um, mulching is very important as well. Um, so we recommend this in basically all gardens, especially it can get very hot in the, in the Georgia heat, even in the shade. Um, so having that layer of mulch does help with some temperature regulation, helps with moisture regulation, helps keep weeds down, helps keep diseases down. Mulch is just a great option um, to have in your shade garden, in any garden really. Um, and you can also get a little bit artistic with it with different colors and types of mulch and things like that. We recommend about four inches of um, mulch on your plants, especially the, the woody ornamentals and uh, the, the herbaceous perennials. But if you're looking at mulching around a tree, we recommend what we call kind of feathering in the mulch. So you don't necessarily want those four inches of mulch around the tree. You want kind of a, a collar where the tree trunk is exposed and still gets airflow. Um, so you can kind of gradually feather in or take a rake and kind of spread out the mulch. So it's about an inch or less around that tree. You really don't want to ever build up organic layers around tree trunks. That is a massive, massive disease risk, even for very mature trees. Okay, so now, as I said, this is my favorite part, um, the design tips. So if anybody tuned into our ornamental um, container gardening talk, there's going to be a lot of similar terminology here, but when you're actually designing, it can be very helpful to know this vocabulary and have an idea of how to actually use your plants. Um, because you may know what types of plants you like, but you may not know how to actually integrate the colors and the textures. So first up is color. Um, obviously, in shade gardens, you are dealing with mostly green foliage. Um, that's usually how they turn out, but there are really smart ways to use accent colors, and you can bring in a pretty substantial palette if you know what you're doing and if you have access to the right varieties. Um, and because it is a shade garden, um, there can be some extra depth to it with the different layers. And so a warmer color or a showier color will be that much more dramatic. Typically we're going to see cooler tones, so even our greens are going to be more bluish, grayish, um, and then in sun, full sun plants, you'll see typically warmer tones. So if you think of zinnias, you know, very bright reds, orange, yellows, uh, versus, you know, hostas, which are mainly lavenders, um, you know, there's some um, bugleweed, which is like a, a nice pretty blue violet, things like that. Um, if you want to have something, say impatience are a great way to integrate some warmer colors. There's a lot of different variety in them. Um, and say you really, really love orange and you want some orange integration, but you also have a beautiful fuchsia bleeding heart, that may clash. Um, you know, an orangey red with a, a blue toned fuchsia can be pretty hard to integrate. This is where you would use a transitional color. So you wouldn't plant them right next to each other, but you would use a white or a silvery plant or even a pale blue or a lavender. Um, so that's something to consider. You can have all of the colors that you want, but to make it a little bit more cohesive, you may need to add in some other things you weren't expecting. If you don't really care about flowers and you want to focus on foliage, variegated varieties are a great way to break up that green color. Uh, that you could be stuck with. So lots of variegated hostas, um, caladiums have a great variation in their leaves. And when I say variegated, that basically just means a single leaf has some different colors on it, um, ranging from a paler green to a darker green. And we have some examples of that later. And then finally, um, use, I would recommend using warm colors in the shade sparingly. Like I said, they can be a very, very dramatic accent. But if you use them everywhere, it can be a little too busy. It can be a little clashy. Um, but again, that may be something that you like. So this is, these are just guidelines. So feel free to experiment however you can. Nobody's going to go into your garden and say, what a terrible job. This is how you express yourself. <laughs> so, and if they do, maybe get new friends. But um, 
it's just really important to kind of have an idea uh, of groundwork as you're starting this. So also, if you can't really find any warm colors, like say you don't like how the warm and patients look, you can use your decor, you know, maybe a bright orange Adirondack chair or painting a yellow bicycle and then you know, holding it against a tree or something, adding, adding pops of color that way. Um, it's okay if they're a little bit artificial. Again, it's all your, uh, your artistic sense. So we're coming back to this picture because I just really, really like it. Um, and we're gonna nerd out about design for, for a little while here. Um, so this is a great interface. Like I said, the, the lawn is open shade. Um, but that it must get at least six hours of sun. So I'd say this probably gets between the lawn itself gets between four and six hours of sun. But we had a lot we have a lot of shade loving plants to the right. So that tells me that these people have put a lot of care into actually planning out where the sun and where the shade lines hit um, because everything here is thriving. So what I want y'all to do is just pick out the colors here. Um, I see obviously a lot of green. But to me, that's not the first thing that pops because that's the background. The thing that pops is going to be those blue along the stonework and that gorgeous burgundy lorepetalum to the right. That's going to be what, what I consider a statement piece. That's a great use of color in a shade garden. And something big like a lorepetalum here is going to also add to your shade too. And then they've got the little blue flowers along the edge. Um, and I like how they've used these because you see one clump, two clump, three clump, moving across uh, the stonework, it creates a sense of rhythm because on either side, there's you know the, the lighter green heuchera or coral bells pretty much near all of these blue flowers. So that's a really nice sense of rhythm going in the same direction. So that's a great way to use color as well. And you can also see in the background, the difference between the blue toned greens in the foreground and then the yellower toned greens in the background where there's obviously a lot more sun. So that's a good example of that contrast as well. Here, I love how they use this. This is a great example of minimal flowers and maximum foliage. We see a lot of hostas. Um, so hostas are gonna be those, those big leaves to the left of the container there. Um, so when I look at this picture, I want y'all to think of where your eye is drawn, of course, but I look and naturally I see that container. But what I see first is that little fluffy guy on the bottom. I think he's really interesting. He's a really pop of a nice warm green, uh, almost yellow in this otherwise pretty blue toned garden. And he doesn't really look out of place though, but that's because of the really smart placement right next to him of the variegated hosta. So his color is echoed in the edges of those leaves while the center of those leaves is more cohesive with the blue tone of the rest of the garden. So that's a great way to integrate something that sets off an area of your garden, but doesn't make it stick out like a sore thumb. It, it's a really nice use of blending. And then here is just a, a very classic use of color in the shade garden. You've got uh, your hostas in the middle. I will comment on this a little bit. We do typically want to see threes and fives in design principles. Um, and of course we do see two here. So the symmetry is a little bit more bilateral. Um, you know, it's more like cut in half than actual, you know, more like a kaleidoscope, if you will. But I think it's a good use of color. Um, so this purple is obviously the dominant feature. It's also got the variegated leaves, the darker on the outside, the lighter on the inside. Um, and then that's kind of mirrored by the hostas, which are reversed with the lighter on the outside, darker on the inside. You have that transitional white color between the blue and the purple, so that prevents it all from uh, melding together. It looks a, a little bit overgrown, not quite messy, um, but it does look a little bit busy. And we will talk about why right now, and that's because of the texture. So when you're thinking about design, you also need to think about texture. And texture can be really useful if you want to plant um, a single variety or a single species of something. So if you want to do a fern garden, all sorts of different ferns have different textures. Hostas will have all sorts of different textures. Um, so this can be a really good way to, to spice up the, um, the uniform garden and have it cohesive but still interesting. 
So different sizes and shapes of leaves are going to lend themselves to different textures. A more fine texture are going to be ferns, uh, grasses or grass-like plants, smaller flowers, mosses, um, I'd even say something like stone crop, uh, creeping jenny, things that tolerate shade um, and creep along as ground cover. Those are fine textures and this is actually why I think the previous picture looked a little bit busy. When you have too much of a fine texture, it looks very, very busy and it can very easily look unkempt. Um, so fine textures are typically used along borders and as filler space uh, to kind of make things more interesting to break up larger textures. Now medium textures are going to be slightly larger leaves, maybe uh, more rounded plants, um, more almost spherical. So your heuchera, which are coral bells, your astilbe, impatience, columbine. Um, this is not exhaustive. These are just very common ones to have in your garden. These are great for medium textures. They are good for establishing rhythm, like we talked about before. So planting heuchera at certain intervals. You also have some medium textured hostas with, um, you know, if the inches are about two to three inches, maybe even up to four inches across, those can be a good medium texture. And um, they also lend themselves to flowers, which are more of a fine texture. So you can have multiple textures within the same plant. Um, so know your plant, know, know what works well in your space. And then finally, a coarse texture just means larger leaves. So your elephant ears, your large hostas, um, caladiums, things like that. And another way to integrate kind of a texture is matte leaves versus shiny leaves. Um, a great example would be fern leaves, which really don't reflect light um, as much. If you think of like a Christmas fern or something, obviously a staghorn fern is kind of waxy and does reflect light a little bit, uh, but not really compared to a camellia, which loves shade um, and has very shiny leaves or rhododendrons, which have very waxy leaves. So that can also add some interest in your space as well as thinking about what type of light is reflected from the, from the leaves. So here's a great use of a, of a fern garden, of a texture, of texture in a fern garden. My goodness, um, having a little trouble today. So the most of what you see here are ferns, uh, with the exception of the hosta in the middle and the colored flowers. Um, so you'll see it looks like about one species of fern having that fine texture planted at intervals. I see three specific spaces that have this fern kind of trailing backwards. Um, we've got a pop of color with the pink flowers, but also the clusters of these add some, some textural interest as well, because a lot of the other plants in here are, are skinny, uh, they have skinny leaves, or they come to a point, something like that. But adding those round flower clusters can also create some interest as well. Um, so just using those different colors and textures can really add interest because this looks, to me, this looks very, very natural. Um, it really does. And that's what you really want in your shade garden. You don't necessarily want something that's perfectly cultivated. This is also a great use of texture um, and a good example of depth. Uh, so when I saw this, my favorite thing about this picture is that they use their textures of their cultivated plants to blend in their property to the natural world around them. So if you think about it, these trees in the background, if you take them close up, these oak leaves are going to be huge. They're going to be what we would consider a medium to a coarse texture. They're going to be much bigger than the Japanese maple leaves that we see, but because of how it's spaced, they're very similar. So as you walk forward, you see the natural forest, and then you see the Japanese maple, and then some laurels, um, and then some other shrubs coming forward to the ferns, and then finally the heuchera. And so your, your texture is getting a little bit bigger um, and a little bit more interesting as you come forward, and it peaks in these containers, um, which are very obviously cultivated. Um, you've got some bleeding hearts. That's that nice red fuchsia that you see and then a hosta in uh, one of the other containers. So it just is a really nice way to blend in your scenery and make it look very, very natural while still making it interesting um, without making it stick out. And then here we have a nice white. White is a transitional color, but it's also a very sophisticated color. 
Um, so we've got these hydrangeas up here um, and these cluster flowers right against the house, which is also pretty neutrally painted. Some other uh, design tips, I really recommend utilizing decor. Of course, this is going to um, be dependent on how much man-made aesthetic you want, uh, but some people really have a hard time getting warmer colored plants to establish. So when in doubt, you know, just introduce something, you know, a red bench or a yellow bicycle, like I mentioned, or a couple of warmer colored pots, um, or even just natural terracotta pots. They look very natural. They are very obviously an earth tone, but they do tend to warm up a space a little bit. Um, so that's a really great way to enhance your plants, but I would recommend not overdoing it. Um, warm colors aren't typically seen too often in shade gardens because when they're overused, it can just look a little off. Um, you know, shade naturally has a cooler toned setting. Um, now, you know, depending on how you use your space, that could give a really cool um, aesthetic if you like that. It's something to experiment with. Uh, but just when you're starting out, you know, having some rules can be helpful. When you're thinking about your containers too, think about the color and shape. Um, do you want to have some contrast? Do you want to have some consistency? Uh, so you may be able to, to plant some cast iron plant, which is a long, flat, pointed leaf. You may want to plant that in a more rounded pot uh, to really add some contrast and grounding to it, or you may want to keep that length and plant it in a very tall square pot and reflect that plant motif. Um, so just think about what you want out of your containers um, and to kind of like I was mentioning with the shiny leaves versus the matte leaves, shiny finishes versus matte finishes can make a big difference in your garden and what sticks out and what blends in. Uh, as far as containers as well. And then the final design tip I'm going to give you is uh, paths. So a lot of people get really excited about the plants and they plant and they plant and they plant and they plant themselves into a corner. Um, <laughs> they don't really consider adding a path and they are very important, especially if you have an expansive garden because you need to provide a place to go. Um, it doesn't always need to be flagstones, doesn't always need to be gravel. It could just be bare grass. It could be moss. I love moss paths. They're very, very great for compacted soils, um, but they create a nice flow to your garden. And like I said, people know where to go. They also allow you to work your garden a little bit easier and um, they just help keep a, an area weed free. When you're selecting your paths, I do, of course, recommend the path of least resistance. If you have a lot of property, you may have um, some deer paths. Uh, you may have a path worn by your dog who just cuts his laps every morning and every afternoon, and he just likes to do that. Don't fight that. Um, go with it, because especially animals and nature is going to pick the path of least resistance um, and the most natural and convenient way to get through your land. Um, and you can also think about targeting compacted areas. If you're just fighting and fighting and fighting with, you know, this hard clay area and you can't really get anywhere, there's a lot of rocks and it's just hard to deal with, put a path through it, put a little, um, you know, picnic area there with some flagstones or cobblestones. Um, work with what you have. Don't bang your head against a wall if, if it's difficult. So here are just some examples of paths that I found. This one is obviously very simple. Um, you know, maybe they had some leftover stones from when they were building and they just kind of threw some down. You can see that very thick layer of mulch. Um, that's very good. I would like to see it a little bit uh, shallower near the tree collars there. Um, but for the, mo for the most part, it's, it's pretty good. Um, this is how shade gardens should probably start out. It does look a little sparse. But this is a very young garden. I would venture uh, this is maybe a single season old, um, you know, maybe, maybe up to a year. These plants are really going to fill in. Um, they're going to double and triple in size. So I would say these people really took time to think about what it's going to look like five and ten years in the future and giving it, each plant its proper space. Um, the flagstones are spread out a little bit. That may be an artifact of just how many they had. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly spaced for 
a stride. You know, it's more about creating flow and a sense of direction so people know where to go. Here's a very similar motif, but this is in much denser shades. So you can see these are uh, spruce. And um, the flagstones themselves actually have a leaf motif, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, very reflective of some of the other plants there. Um, they have kind of the, the parallel leaf veins like a hosta would have. And it's just trailing around the trees. You'll notice it doesn't go right up to the trees. You don't want to compact those roots too much. You do want to have a buffer of, you know, maybe a hosta or two between your path and the tree. Um, and you can tell they have actually lifted up the skirt or trimmed some of the bottom branches off. Um, that can really enable uh, and free up some space for your path as well, but you want to do that very carefully. You don't want to stress the tree out too much. These are very mature trees, so they can definitely handle it. Um, but yeah, you can see a lot of the shade loving plants that we've talked about here. Lots of hostas, lots of coral bells. So now with that, um, we are going to go to some recommendations. So we're going to start with annuals. Um, and we've got a couple here. Native Impatience is a really, really great one. Uh, Y'all may actually know it by the name Jewelweed. It is native. It is one of the few that actually can handle wet feet um, and prefers moist soils. So if you are combating some moisture issues, it's actually a great one to have. We see it a lot in floodplains um, and next to creek beds. Um, it's, and it's beautiful. It's uh, probably a fine to medium fine texture. Um, the flowers are all at the ends of the stem. So there's these little pops of orange and pink everywhere when they bloom. Um, so with each of these plants, we do have some characteristics and that you should know. Um, and you should know these for all of the plants that go in your shade garden, because you want them all to be able to hang out in the same spot. Um, so they like full to part shade. Um, they do prefer shade. They don't really thrive uh, in the sun too often. You're going to want to space them out about eight inches because they're going to reseed themselves. They do come back every year. For the longest time, I thought they were actually um, perennials, but they just reseed themselves so well. So you want to give them space to do that. Um, they are fine with low fertility. Um, they don't handle drought very well because like I said, they do prefer wet feet and you'll see these guys uh, really pop out in June and July. Um, so you'll see these a lot here. We, they're a great native understory plant. Um, so if you go to a park with some paths along the creek, odds are you'll see these right now. Um, so just so you do know, it does reseed itself. Um, so if something happens and you do want to remove it, you will need to remove it before it blooms and goes to seed, and it does need moister soil than most. <clears throat> now, regular impatiens, um, these have such a wide color variety. Um, I mean, their leaves range from light pale green to dark green to a bronzish color. Uh, there are salmon colored flowers, there are white colored flowers, there are purplish and reds. Um, if you really want to introduce some color and you really want an easy plant, impatience are going to be the way to go. They're also a great nectar source. Hummingbirds love them and they only get about 18 to 36 inches tall. They don't take up too much space and again, they're annuals. They will, um, they may reseed pretty well, but usually uh, you will probably need to replace them after a couple of years. Um, if you keep them very moist, they can handle full sun, but for the most part, they're gonna prefer that full shade to partial shade. Um, they, they really need those wet feet if they are in the sunlight to help them combat, and, um, combat drought conditions and maintain their temperature. Again, um, you want about eight to 12 inch centers, so four to six inches on either side. Um, moderate fertility, you probably won't need to fertilize these if you amend the soil correctly. Of course, you know, they're not going to do too well in drought. Um, they're going to bloom around the same time as native impatience. They're going to have a bit longer of a bloom period, but again, this may be variety specific. So definitely check that when you do select uh, your color. And then they do like high organic soils best, but again, that usually comes with being a shade garden because you'll probably have 
uh, leaf drop, even if it's underneath evergreen trees, you'll still have needle drop and organic matter. Uh, but when planting, just make sure you prep the soil as you need to. Coleus are also a great option. Um, a lot of people think about these with full sun plantings. Uh, they are kind of a landscape staple. Uh, they also tolerate wet soils, but they don't really like them too much. Uh, they can get about 24 to 30 inches tall, um, but in the shade, they'll probably be a little bit shorter. That's mainly when they're in full sun. Um, but they do really, really well in shade and part shade. They are a really, really great plant to start out with, especially if you want to make a shade container garden. Um, this is one of those plants that if you just wanted to stick to one species, then yeah, go coleus all the way because that is a great example of all the variety they have. Um, the problem is you do need to deadhead them and that's going to extend their bloom period because they do actually bloom. Um, but again, if you miss it, obviously it's not that big of a problem because their foliage is pretty spectacular. Um, now, when you see pinching at transplant, that's going to help a plant recover. So it's kind of like what we do with herbs. When you transplant it into the ground, you want to pinch it off at the top. That apical bud is what we call it, that very, very top bud. Um, and that's going to encourage it to bush out a bit. So for every spot that you pinch, two buds are going to burst and you will have two branches there. So that just encourages it to fill out and grow some more and establish a little bit more quickly. Um, they can be, can be a problem with uh, some powdery mildew because they can be a little bit dense, but for the most part, they're, they're pretty good. So those are three solid perennials I would recommend, um, or three solid annuals, excuse me. We do have some really good perennial recommendations, um, and these are where some of my favorite plants are. Uh, first up is coral bells. You can use the term coral bell and heuchera interchangeably. They're the same thing. And the range on these leaves is almost as much as coleus. They range all the way from lime green to deep burgundy, almost black, to a salmon color. It's really pretty spectacular. Um, if y'all get Better Homes and Gardens, there was actually a feature piece done on them within the past four months. I actually tore out that page because it lists 15 different varieties and all of these colors of leaves. And I just love to have it on hand to recommend to people. Very low maintenance. Um, a lot of them are purple or have some sort of purple incorporation in their foliage. But like I said, there's a lot of different um, varieties. Full to partial shade, of course. Depending on how much sunlight you give them, that can affect their color. Um, so if they have a little bit more sunlight, but not enough to burn them, that color will be a little bit richer. But if they are in full or dense shade, it may be a little bit lighter. Um, it's not really going to look washed out or anything, um, but that may just affect um, how it establishes in your own space. Again, moderate fertility. You don't need to do too much to it. Just don't let it dry out completely for extended periods of time. Um, they do bloom through June, but honestly, I have one of these, uh, this exact uh, variety on my porch in full shade, and it has been blooming since May. Um, so I think that can be variety dependent. It can be temperature dependent. We had a very, very mild spring, thank goodness. Um, so I think that made it really happy. Uh, but yeah, these are great container plants. Just be aware they are perennials, so you may need to up pot them at some point if you want to do a container. Um, but yeah, if you do put them too far into the sun, like I mentioned, they do bleach in the sun if you let their roots dry out. Now that if you put it in partial shade versus full shade, you may see a little bit of a difference, but they will only really bleach and look unattractive if they are in full sun. Hostas are some of the most well-known shade plants. A uh, great, great starter plant. Um, you do need to typically split them um, every couple of years because they really, really bush out and they can get pretty overcrowded. Uh, but there's a lot of different foliage effects with these guys. Typically, uh, you're not going to see color variation as much as you will texture um, variation and variegation as far as the pattern of colors. They love full shade. They don't do well in full sun for the most part at all. 
um, they need some relief. And they're going to be a little bit bigger spacing. So you need to give them about 18 inches all around. Um, they love high organic soils. And again, fertility needs nothing really to worry about there. They do bloom from June to August. So they have those nice um, tall stalks. Usually the blooms are white or lavender colored. Um, there are some different varieties that are a deeper purple or even a blue, um, but just, you know, shop around to what you might like. Um, this is a great example of a plant that may look underwhelming when you see it in the garden center, but once it establishes in your landscape, it can be a showstopper um, if it's taken care of and you let it bloom and you divide it when you need to. Um, we do like to call these deer candy. I don't know what it is, but deer will eat these before anything else in your garden. So if you do have a deer problem, I uh, would recommend <laughs> keeping a close eye on these guys, buying some extra, um, and just accepting that the deer are definitely gonna, gonna eat some of them. Um, slugs can also be a major problem on hostas, uh, but you can typically just uh, pick them off. They're not, not usually too bad, but they can be a little bit of an aesthetic pest. Bugleweed is great because it also doubles as a ground cover. Um, you can see it's not, it's not really creeping like a lot of ground covers that we see, but it does um, kind of form rosettes along the way and fill in. It's also a fantastic nectar source. Um, they've got these beautiful uh, bluish purplish flowers. It looks very similar to the mint family and uh, sage flowers. Um, but they do have a, they are a spring flower. So a lot of what we talked about flowers in the summer. So if you want to think about your pollinators, this would be a great thing to add uh, for an early bloomer in the spring. Um, obviously they've got that nice purple foliage, green, there are variegated varieties as well. But this is a nice way to incorporate some purple um, in addition to the flowers. They have a little bit of a tighter spacing. They'll fill in a bit, a bit quicker. Um, they are pretty deer tolerant. Deer don't like these as much. So if you need a good ground cover uh, to fill in some tree roots or just to fill in a space, I'd say these are a great option. Um, and again, they're going to bloom April to May. Um, and then they may kind of melt out in the heat. Um, so as it gets really, really hot, you may see some dieback. They may not be thriving if they have a little bit too much sun. Um, also, their color will kind of bleach out. They'll be just more of a green as opposed to seeing that really, really pretty purple center on that new growth. And also, bugleweed is, is also known as a juga. A lot of these have, have two names. Um, bleeding hearts are a very, very cool um, addition to gardens. Um, they also are a spring flower. They're very unusual. Uh, they look very tropical, in my opinion, but you can see why they're called bleeding hearts. Um, they're about 18 to 30 inches tall, so they give some height to your shade garden, uh, but they do require full shade. They don't tolerate a lot of sunlight at all. Um, uh, they bloom from June to August, um, but there are more varieties that bloom in the spring. So that's why we consider it a spring flower. The heavy, heavy blooming season is more June as opposed to July and August. Um, so even though June feels like summer here, um, it is technically more spring. Um, again, they really like high organic soil and they do need to be kept a little bit moist, but that's really nothing new. Um, most plants like to be kept a little bit moist, just don't drown the roots. And then finally uh, is Lenten Rose, which is a very classic name for hellebores. These are one of my favorite flowers. They are so interesting. Um, they don't have too much color variety. They can range from a burgundy-ish, reddish, orange to just a green flower. Um, but most of what we see are purple, uh, the, the purple variety here. Um, sometimes they are white as well, but they're very, very pretty, very natural looking. Um, they tend to clump and spread, kind of like daffodils do. Um, so they're a great plant to, to share with friends. Uh, you're going to have to divide these at some point because um, they will get a little bit overcrowded. Um, and they actually bloom more closely to winter. Um, so they bloom a little bit before daffodils and sometimes through the daffodil season as well um, into March and April. 
Um, and then starting in May, you'll start to see those really cool little seed heads that they produce. They have these little seed pods that have a point on the end. Um, they actually prefer slightly alkaline soil. So this is something to know. Typically, if you have a hellebore plot, mostly hellebores are going to be there because they do like a different pH than a lot of other plants. Um, and again, they do uh, thrive in partial shade, uh, but they really, really dislike heat and intense sunlight. Um, so I would say partial to full shade for these. Uh, do not plant them near brick walls or actual foundations. They are very sensitive to that heat. Um, so if there's heat radiating off of anywhere, uh, they, you will see them start to wilt. Um, and a lot of the dark greener, the greener foliage that you see, they are evergreen. Um, so they won't bloom year round, but you will have some foliage there year round. And then finally, ferns, which uh, along with hostas are probably the most common shade garden plant. Um, lots of different types of ferns. Japanese painted fern is one of my favorite. It's very, very pretty. Holly fern, autumn fern. Um, I wish I would put in a couple more pictures of things like uh, staghorn fern and, and things like that, which are a little bit more tropical, but they can do pretty well here uh, as well, depending on our humidity and how well you care for it. But there's a lot of different textures that you can use. Um, they're very, very classic. They have a lot of different species. They do prefer a little bit more moist environment, um, but they're really, really great to get that woodland motif and aesthetic and, and that really natural feel. Um, they also do really well in containers as well, especially on porches where you can keep them in the shade and uh, you can water them really well there. Um, okay, the quality of these pictures does not translate well at all, so I apologize for that. Um, but liriope is really, really great in a space that you want grass, but you can't grow it because it doesn't get enough sunlight. Um, so liriope and then mondo grass, which we'll talk about in the next slide, are really great options for that. Liriope, you have a little bit more color variation. And in my opinion, the blooms are a little bit more dramatic on this one. So you'll see, you can barely see it, but in that upper right, they have really pretty, um, almost uh, hyacinth-like blooms, the dark purple clusters that kind of form a column. Um, but they're lilac colored flowers. They can be a deeper purple, sometimes bluish, depending on the variety. Um, and then they, those will actually turn into a little black fruit um, and a little black berry. So you've probably seen this before. You can have dark green varieties, medium green varieties, variegated liriope. Um, so this is a great option and it fills in really nicely, as you can see in the lower right, that's like a carpet of liriope there. Um, and you can also mow it. Same with mondo grass, um, very, very close relative to liriope, uh, forms and spreads through very dense clumps. Um, and they have underground stems, so they have the rhizomes, kind of like Bermuda grass and uh, bamboo. So the foliage is usually a dark green. Um, but it actually even has a variety with black leaves. It almost looks black. There's, I don't know that there are any true black plants, but very, very, very dark green. So it gives that very lush texture. And um, mondo grass is a little bit finer of a texture than liriope, and it handles being mowed a little bit better. Um, so you can get a dwarf mondo grass that is very low growing. Um, and very suitable for growing in between like stepping stone cracks. It's great to line your path with to integrate that kind of fine texture, uh, but you can't really, when you can't really grow actual grass there. Now we get into shrubs. Um, I'm not going to go too heavy on what I call green architecture. Um, so the, the elements that build height and structure and are typically woody. Um, because I would recommend you kind of experiment with less permanent installations um, before you really start hitting this too hard. Uh, but a very, very easy to find, easy to work with, shade loving shrub is the Japanese plum yew. Odds are you've seen it. There are a couple different varieties that um, have a little different texture of the leaves, um, but it is an evergreen shrub, so it's a great option if you just need to fill a space and you don't want junipers. 
Um, great, great substitute for junipers. Much more tolerant of environmental conditions. Doesn't really have the branch dieback we see in a lot of creeping juniper. Um, so it can, it's a good space filler, but it is, it is a green monster. It's, it's just a lot of green right there. So would recommend planting something else to help break that up. You know, maybe a different color green, a more medium to coarse textured plant, or, um, you know, just some flowers or maybe some flocks or something along with it. It's pretty adapted to most moist, um, most of our soils here, it can handle clay and things like that, but it does need good drainage. Um, everything has its limit. Very deer resistant. Deer do not like this at all. Um, give it at least four feet and you don't really need to prune it if you put it in the right place. Um, a lot of these plants won't require any pruning at all unless you just need to clean them up or remove some dead material. Um, but yeah, you really shouldn't need to, to prune this guy at all. He'll look very natural. He'll stick to his space and fill in really nicely. Oak leaf hydrangea is uh, a really great option if you want those nice, uh, very classic southern flowers, but you want a nice natural looking leaf. That's why we call it oak leaf. It is reminiscent of red oak leaves. Um, they can get four to six feet tall and about three to five feet wide. So again, they're a great space filler. They love understory. Um, they're pretty irregular unless you prune them into a specific shape, but I wouldn't really recommend hedging them or anything like that. You really need to selective prune hydrangeas. Um, and then they have a panicle style flower, so it's more of like a cone um, that can be up to 12 inches. They dry really beautifully. And then in the fall, these leaves are actually going to turn an orange red color. They're one of the few shade plants that will actually turn color with your deciduous trees. So it's a really interesting um, uh, feature to have in your garden. And in the spring when things warm up, they have this beautiful silvery sheen uh, to their buds as well. So it's, it's year round interest for your garden. And then sweet shrub is also a really interesting one. It is native, um, so I do like to recommend it. It is very, very fragrant. So we talk a lot about color and texture, but fragrance is something that you can still have in a shade garden as well. Um, so a lot of times you'll find it along stream banks. It can handle damp soils. Um, it, like most things, it doesn't like to be completely dried out, but it's pretty versatile. Um, and the foliage is also very, um, very aromatic when you crush it. So hence the name sweet shrub. Um, the flowers are really interesting. Uh, they are very, they have very skinny little petals, um, but they have a really, really pretty deep earthy red color. Um, and, then, and they do come in different color varieties. Uh, but of course, you know, amend the soil appropriately. They can grow about eight to 10 feet tall. Um, so if you want more of a natural kind of less groomed appearance, they do really, really well. I, and you can see in the upper picture, it kind of looks similar to privet. So it can really take that, take the place of that horrible, horrible invasive plant. Um, so if you're looking for something to plant that has a similar aesthetic as far as it can get leggy, um, and fill out a space really quickly. Sweet shrub is a really good option. And then we also have rhododendrons, a very classic plant as well. Rhododendrons, mountain laurel, and um, hydrangeas are all great understory shrubs with a lot of color options. Um, so they could be from four feet to 10 feet tall and they, they can be huge. Um, so definitely give them the space that they need. You don't typically need to plant too much else around it. It's got really nice foliage. It's got really nice flowers and it needs the space to spread. Um, loves partial shade and higher um, uh, soil with a, a higher acidity or a lower pH. That's why you'll often see these planted in tandem with pine trees because pine trees also uh, prefer kind of more acidic soil and condition the soil that way. Um, but once they're mature, you don't necessarily need to worry about irrigating them too much. And they really, really hate wet feet. They don't do well at all. They are very, very susceptible to root rots. And then finally, we're just going to talk about a couple of trees if you want to enhance 
uh, the shadiness of your space. Naturally, flowering dogwood is a great native variety. Um, there's a lot of different varieties of dogwood. Um, they are native understory trees, so they thrive in shade. They flower in shade. Their flowers are going to turn into these nice bright red berries. Um, and they have a really graceful structure. Um, they have a similar aesthetic to Japanese maples in kind of the horizontal or the stratification of their branches. Um, and then the leaves are also going to turn like a scarlet, a deep crimson almost. Um, very, very pretty to have uh, for your fall color. And there's a ton of different varieties. Honestly, we could go on and on about dogwoods alone, but would definitely recommend that. Um, downy serviceberry is a great native tree. Um, it's very common in the mountains, but I have seen a lot of it used um, in ornamental plantings here, kind of in North Atlanta and in, in Decatur. Um, it is deciduous, so it also has very, very pretty fall color. You can see that nice bright orange in the upper right. Um, and then in the spring, it's going to have these beautiful white flowers. Um, they cluster in April, and then they also uh, have a purplish blue fruit in early summer. So great for birds. Again, great year-round interest. Um, it's excellent in the landscape, and it blends in really well to wooded areas because of its natural uh, growth habit. It does prefer a little bit more acidic soil. So again, this would do well kind of where you would plant rhododendrons. They have different uh, varieties of service berry that grow to different heights. So they do have dwarf varieties and um, you know normal growing varieties as well, depending on the space that you need to fill. Uh, but it does grow best as an understory tree, just like dogwoods. So with that, um, I did not put my closing slide in there. I usually do, I apologize for that. Um, but we are right on time. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Let's see. And see if we can uh, talk a little bit. So I think uh, my colleague Carol is actually the uh, extension agent in the northern part of the county. So I see she's been on here kind of addressing some questions here. Um, but I'm just going to scroll through and see if there's anybody, um, name the plants as we talk about them. Yes, I tried, I tried to do that. Um, I couldn't quite tell in all of the pictures, but I hope when we went through the individual plants that kind of gave you some guidance. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so talking about repellents, um, Irish Spring Soap, we, it's funny, we actually had this discussion, um, we, my friend has a homestead up in Cherokee County and he, the agent up there actually, Josh, we were just at his place helping him pick berries and he has been experimenting with Irish Spring versus Melorganite. The Irish Spring hasn't really helped that much. Um, they just annihilated the apple buds and a lot of his soybeans, but wherever he had the Melorganite, they didn't really bother. They haven't touched any of that. So um, Melorganite is a pretty good uh, deer repellent if you if you need that. Um, yes, Car I'm glad Carol brought that up. Hellebores can irritate your skin whenever you're working in the garden. Just blanket disclaimer. Um, there are weeds with kind of a, a milky substance when you break their stems that can also irritate your skin, all sorts of things. Um, is it possible to get a copy of this meeting and presentation? We are recording it. We will post it to our social media and I will also email it out uh, using the Eventbrite list serve that I had. Um, what time of year would be best to start a shade garden? Um, different plants require different types of um, different times of planting. What I would do is actually start now because we're in the heat of summer. We are maximum sun exposure. So you are going to have the least amount of shade, uh, probably right around now. So that can be a really good thing to base your landscape design off of. Uh, I would never really plant anything in the heat of summer. Typically, especially if you're doing perennials, uh, you can do them spring and fall when it's a little bit more mild. Um, but if you want to you know, do annuals, you can do spring as well. Um, to do, 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 oh yeah, I did have a question about the best way to get rid of slugs. Um, you know, the, I've heard an old wives tale about beer. 
Um, unfortunately, we don't really have any tried and true methods. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, you know, salt is obviously a good one. Uh, they don't really like salt. Um, so, you know, having like little containers of salt around can help. Um, but yeah, I've heard they get attracted to beer and then they can kind of slide in there and then get um, trapped in the bottle or in a bowl. Um, oh yeah, so somebody was saying, uh, what was I talking about as far as the deer repellent? It's malorganite. So it is actually um, a desiccated and compacted sewage compound. It's a soil amendment. So it would be just like filling bags of compost or black cow um, and kind of hanging them up or, you know, placing the bags around the, uh, the garden. Uh, but that's what malorganite is. It's pretty much the, the main organic repellent that we've actually seen work, at least anecdotally, pretty consistently. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Um, best time to move hostas. Uh, malorganite, I believe it's M-I-L, I'm going to need to type it. <laughs> uh, I've been talking too long. Okay, I just typed it in the chat. Um, malorganite. So best time to move hostas, the best time to move any plant is before it fully wakes up, but after the soil, um, it, when it's not freezing. So I'd say, you know, February, when you would move any other, any other plant. Um, you can also move it once things cool down. Um, so in the fall, whenever things get kind of mild. Um, but anytime you transfer, uh, plant, um, definitely want to make sure it's well watered, even if you do it in the winter. Um, okay, so mastilbe, which are another great plant. Uh, they're very, very pretty, great flowers, uh, very, kind of reminiscent of celosia. Um, they get a little bit of early morning sun. Half of them did great and got beautiful flowers. Half of them dried up and died back. Was this your first year planting them? Because that to me sounds like just a plant problem on the front end as far as if it how it was stored at the nursery or maybe the roots were a little bit damaged if it sat in water a little too long and some of them can handle the transplant shock and some of them just could not um so for that i would want to know when they started to die back when you planted them how old they were uh things like that uh what shade and sun do hydrangeas do best in i'd say partial to medium um to even to full full shade usually um they can they can be okay and they may not flower as much but definitely medium shade i'd say look at dappled sunlight if you look at pictures of um augusta national um they have a lot of indirect light there uh and their rhododendrons and hydrangeas do really really well so it's okay if they're if they're in a lot of shade but some bright indirect light helps as well um Oh, Denise is in California. Thank you for joining. Yeah, you're a little, a uh, couple hours behind us there. Um, all right, what other, let's see. Uh, Beach Hollow Wildflower Farm. Yeah, there are a lot of really great sources for native plants. Um, if you want native plants specifically, I would really go to a smaller, more local garden shop and let them know that you are specifically interested in native. A lot of the more mom and pop nurseries will work with you and um, they tend to carry more native plants and know more about the area than maybe like a Home Depot or something like that. Um, if you need a more catered approach. So Home Depot may have more variety, but mom, we like to support local. Um, so if you can't find it um, at Home Depot, definitely go support your mom and pop business as well, um, or a local nursery. They'll be able to offer um, more curated suggestions. Uh, my hydrangeas aren't blooming. Any suggestions? Okay, uh, this can be a problem. Uh, two main things uh, I think of when people tell me that their hydrangeas aren't blooming. I ask them what time they prune them, um, depending on you know what time of year they bloom because a lot of times um, if you prune them at the wrong time you're going to prune off all of the blooming buds um, if you prune them too late so that can be a problem um, i also want to see what your soil profile looks like because if there's not enough phosphorus the roots are not going to be stimulated enough um, or the ph may be too high um, and there's not enough phosphorus available 
So there, that's a multifaceted question. If something isn't performing well, there's a lot of different things we need to look at. Um, but typically when people approach me about hydrangeas not, not blooming, it's because they've been pruned, um, they've pruned off all of the, the buds and didn't, didn't really know it. If it's never bloomed and you haven't pruned it, that's more likely a location or a soil issue. Um, all right, anybody else? Real quick before we go, I do have a survey. If y'all could fill that out, I'm gonna put that in the chat. Um, we like to get feedback on our presentations just so we know we're hitting our marks. We like to know who we're reaching um, and just, you know, making sure that we're being as effective as possible. So, um, and also if you're interested in more of the programming that we do, uh, I know there are a lot of people here, I think somebody who's even from Canada um, who signed up. Uh, we are Fulton County Cooperative Extension. We are based in Atlanta, Georgia. So a lot of the recommendations I gave were for the Southeastern United States, um, but you're welcome to attend any of the uh, programs that we have. So let me, I'm going to do, do, do. let me copy this link and I'm going to put it in the chat right here. I will probably put it there a couple of times. Um, we had a great group. We had like 85 people at one point. So that's really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, hope some of you were able to get in from the wait list. Um, thank you all for being courteous with your mute and your cameras. Um, I had a great time with y'all. So thank you so, so much. I'm going to keep copying and pasting that link to the survey in the chat. Um, thank y'all so much. Um, had a great time talking with y'all. Um, great feedback. Thank y'all so much. Um, are other local cooperative extensions offering the same programs? Um, what we've actually tried to do in Georgia is not overlap too much. We are offering similar programs as far as hour long webinars and virtual workshops. Um, but since I did a shade gardening, you know, some, it may be a little while before somebody else does a shade gardening because we have such a broader reach with our webinars. Typically we really hit in-person programming pretty hard. Um, but there's like an online B school that, um, North Carolina state's doing, um, the North Georgia agents did a lot of fruit gardening. Um, so there, there's a lot going on. What I recommend is going, uh, if you just Google UGA cooperative extension calendar, that's going to be a list of what every single agent in Georgia is doing. Thank y'all so much. Also, if any of you are, um, oh, Virginia, Virginia Cooperative Extension is awesome. We did a lot of work with them and their viticulture program. So they should be having a lot of really, really good information. Um, Want to get into landscape design, Angela? Um, books, honestly, uh, books and YouTube. Uh, that's really how I learned. My background is in entomology, it's in bugs. Uh, I did not know how to arrange plants at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew what ate them. Um, so I, you know, a, a friend gave me a couple books that I started to read up on. There's a lot of really great YouTube shows. Honestly, um, I grew up watching Alan Titchmarsh on BBC America. So things like that, um, you know, the landscaping shows, um, finding out what works and what doesn't work. And also just talking to your local extension agent because we have um, like a native plant certificate, we have a landscape design certificate, things like that. So um, if you do read up on it and you find yourself really interested in it and uh, you want to go through a program, check with your local extension office or your local technical schools. They will usually have additional courses if you maintain that interest. All right, y'all, uh, we are 15 minutes over time. I'm gonna put that survey in there one more time. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.